Fiona said, I'm Louise Tully, so I'm the research assistant on this project in NUI Galway, um, and it's a cross-border project, so like as we've explained, some of us are working in Belfast and some in Galway, um, and I've been responsible for the data collection, I suppose, in the Republic of Ireland, and the two girls here have helped us in Northern Ireland, so between us we've managed to carry out the project, and um, between it we've had some challenges re with recruitment and design and lots of things along the way so I, I thought we'd discuss today a bit about kind of those obstacles that we've had and then present some of our emerging results as well and um, the data analysis is still ongoing as well so we've, we've only got kind of preliminary findings so far but we'll take you through what we have anyway um, and this project is funded by Safe Food so it's about weaning practices on the island of Ireland and we've been specifically targeting disadvantaged families for this um, and we've used the term disadvantage quite broadly we've defined it as kind of low income low education and um, ethnic minority but also included people who had perceived um, low social support so um, so in terms of complementary feeding or weaning and um, we use the term weaning in Ireland but in the UK they kind of lean towards complementary feeding I suppose to take away the um, confusion with weaning off breastfeeding as opposed to onto solid foods um, but the the kind of advice in both jurisdictions is that we aim for to introduce solid foods around six months uh, with exclusive breastfeeding for six months and not before four months um, if you're going to start earlier than that. Um, in Ireland we kind of lean towards the, the ESCAN guidance which is a bit more flexible around starting after four months but in the UK they're a little bit more following the Department of Health over there where it's kind of just to aim close to six months so that's just a little bit of difference in the guidelines apart from that we have very similar recommendations around infant feeding and um, there's additional guidance around types of foods drinks and feeding methods so um, staying away from salty sugary foods before one year not introducing um, cow's milk as a drink before one year and then kind of moving quite quickly through different um, textures and lumpy foods to kind of develop oral motor, oral motor skills as well um, so we know that in both Ireland and the UK that we, we don't follow those recommendations. Um, in the Republic of Ireland the data we have is that 18% of infants are given food before 17 weeks or 4 months um, and in Northern Ireland the most recent data we have is 35% of in infants are weaned before that. Um, and so as well as that we also know that there are studies out there that show us that not all of the foods that infants are weaned onto are appropriate. Um, and so we have no data in Ireland to show us why that might be or what are the kind of psychosocial barriers around following infant feeding guidelines. Um, we also have evidence in both the UK and Ireland to show us that um, there's maybe a mismatch between the official recommendations and what kind of professional advice has been given. It isn't always in line and maybe is there kind of room for finding out where the miscommunication is there. Is it between parents themselves or is it kind of a trust issue or what, what's kind of the barriers there with following health professional guidance. And as well as that we know that even when parents do know the guidance it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to follow it, um, it for whatever reason as well. So whilst we have lots of international data suggesting kind of mistrust of recommendations and um, sort of trusting your own instinct over what's been told to you and um, we don't have any again specific to Ireland so that all justifies this study um, and then it was kind of summed up quite nicely in a 2013 paper you know that further exploration of social factors such as the influence of relatives and healthcare staff is needed as they could have influence in the planning of education on weaning, re weaning practices sorry um, so we know that again there's lots of data worldwide about, you know, especially in the UK as well, about why people don't follow guidance. But the determinants of non-adherence to recommendations are, again, these low socioeconomic status, uh, younger mothers, those who are less likely to breastfeed, smokers, and those who use their relative, often grandparents as a caregiver, for whatever reason, again, are more likely to kind of veer away from the recommendations. So the this is the objectives of this study, um, to investigate knowledge, attitudes and behaviours, um, to gain insight into the key barriers and facilitators to find, finding, sorry, to adhering to weaning guidelines and in investigate the key sources of information and guidance parents are using. So this is predominantly a qualitative study. Um, we've aimed with focus groups uh, and we're specifically looking to recruit disadvantaged parents because again we know that those are the groups more likely to veer away from the guidance. Um, 
We also collected some quantitative data in addition to the focus groups. We've had uh, information just on infant health, um, demographics, types of feeding, uh, parental social support and quality of life. And then we also included a nutrition knowledge questionnaire which can be used later on um, maybe to do some further analyses. Um, and in the design of the study we also got feedback from stakeholders on the research tools. So we had a parental panel look over our questionnaire, you know, check over the wording, look over the topic guide, uh, give input into what might get the conversation going. Um, and in addition to that, we also used vignettes in the form of scenarios to kind of get the conversation going where, um, where it was lacking or where parents weren't willing so much to open up. Um, I suppose the idea of the vignettes also is that where parents maybe feel that um, a practice is kind of they don't feel maybe comfortable talking about something they did if they know it's not quite what they were supposed to do or what they were told to do, that it kind of maybe takes the, the onus away from them and kind of you can talk about someone else in relation to that practice. Um, so this is an example. Um, you don't have to read through it all, but it's kind of like, oh, you know, someone has a child and, you know, she's not quite old enough to be weaned, but, you know, her mother says, oh, she might sleep longer through the night if she would, and then the, the mother's kind of a little bit confused. Should I listen to my mother? Because she's had babies before, but then again, the, you know, health nurse or whoever is telling me not to. So these are the kind of things that we took from the literature and figured it would get the conversation going. So they came in quite handy. I think the girls would agree during the um, focus groups. We didn't always need them, but if there was a topic that parents didn't seem to want to open up about, it was nice to just bring them in. Um, so for recruitment in, in both jurisdictions, again, we aimed for disadvantaged parents uh, aged three to sorry, 14 months um, with purposive and sl snowball sampling. Um, we predominantly used community groups that were targeting disadvantaged parents. Um, we had inclusion criteria of, like I said before, a wide like, kind of definition for disadvantaged, which included um, self-support, sorry, self-perceived social support, and we excluded infants that were premature or had feeding problems or that were, um, I think that was it, outside the age range, I suppose. Um, we decided in order to kind of maximise the potential for recruitment, we'd welcome parents to bring along their baby, we would offer a small thank you voucher and we would cover their travel. We also had them in community venues that were familiar to parents and we um, offered tea and coffee and made it quite informal as well. Um, we used screening questionnaires where we could to, to make sure we were getting the right participants, but that was a bit of a challenge in itself. Um, and we had a, a bit of a mix of cities, towns and rural areas, though I think predominantly we were cities uh, in both Northern <laughs> Ireland and the, and the Republic. So for recruitment in the Republic, we used firstly existing contacts with community groups through colleagues um, as well as social media. but the. The community groups that were most successful for recruitment were traveller movements. Uh, we also used groups that uh, targeted disadvantaged parents for the Genesis and Incredible Years programmes. We had an intercultural group, a family support group, teen parents, and also just targeted parent and toddler groups in disadvantaged areas. Um, and some of the challenges were that were low turnout. Um, I think when you're recruiting parents for focus groups, it's kind of a given that babies get sick, babies you know, aren't feeling up to being out and about on the day, it takes longer to get ready. If they've got older kids, sometimes the school run takes longer. So it was very, very difficult to plan. Um, parents would often let us know they weren't going to come, but often they didn't get a chance to let us know. So you might have two people when you were expecting 10. Um, it was just, I think, a barrier of trying to have focus groups of parents. Um, ensuring the correct demographic was another big challenge that we had both sides, I think. Um, because you're going through community groups that target disadvantage but they only target them they don't necessarily exclude people often whilst that's their aim they don't they have quite a mix of parents and when I come in and ask can I do a focus group with the ones who tick these boxes the gatekeeper will say to me you know I can't tell any parent that they can't come along to something so either they all come or they don't or there's a miscommunication with the screening questionnaire sometimes maybe I get loads of screening questionnaires back but then on the day a totally different group of parents turned up and I suppose it depends on from both sides my communication to the gatekeeper and also how much kind of they were willing to engage with me um, um, literacy was a bit of an issue we had to be careful with making the questionnaire and the nutrition knowledge questionnaire that we were inclusive about it that it was suitable that if a parent wasn't English wasn't their first language that if they preferred I could sit down with them and go through it um, 
and just accommodating infants at the venues created its own kind of issues around noise and transcribing and just having enough space and yeah lots of lots of different things to consider. Um, so in the Republic of Ireland we've had 11 focus groups between October and April. Uh, again sometimes two turned up sometimes we had between two and seven um, and they were all transcribed and are being analysed thematically so we have a first round of coding complete on that. Um, so the characteristics for the Republic were we had 46 participants and 44 of those were mothers, uh, one father and one foster mother. Um, the babies were between 3 and 18 months, well, mostly they were 3 to 14 months, we had one 18 month old. Um, and the rest are kind of there, you know, um, and all but nine had started weaning their baby, so most people spoke about their current baby, but then some of them who hadn't started weaning had older kids, so tended to talk about their older babies. So I think another challenge would be maybe for next time we might look at, next time, but if there was a next time, we might look at getting first time mothers, just, or at least kind of separating them. Um, all the babies that attended were either healthy or very healthy. Um, and this is kind of an overview of the um, sort of demographics. Uh, we had a quite, quite a diverse group. Um, and we were probably about half and half with the traditional socioeconomic status and then um, I suppose, yeah, we, we had, because we had so many different indicators of um, disadvantage, it's kind of a mix. Um, there were one group where they were in direct provision, so they were, none of them were Irish and um, in terms of the sensitivity of the questionnaire, I excluded a lot of questions, so that's why there's six unknown for some of them as well. Um, so moving on to the results, um, these are some of the emerging influences on practices. Now having looked at a lot of the literature for um, what's out there on influences on weaning, it's very much in line with the rest of kind of Europe and the published data. Uh, grandparents are a huge, huge influence, um, the internet, social media, um, but then there's baby books as well, there's fear and then there's things around wanting the baby to sleep, that was a big one. Um, and then for all of these, they weren't just positive or positive influences or negative, they were a mix. Some people talked about relying on grandparents, on their own mother, for example. Some people spoke about how the grandmother really, really kept giving unwanted advice. So for some, it was either chalk or cheese. Um, the internet, the same. Some people spoke about social media being their go-to, you know, other parents who've, who've just been ahead of them in a few steps. But sometimes they talked about being in social media groups where the parents were quite judgmental and they felt like they couldn't say anything they did without it being wrong and then that kind of led to a whole confidence conversation as well. Um, in terms of health professionals, again I'll talk about that in a little minute but th there was a mix there too. Um, things like the packaging of commercial baby foods were sometimes um, kind of deceiving in that they leaned parents towards thinking commercial baby foods were healthier than homemade foods but other times they were helpful in that for an example, one parent told me that she was going to put Liga in the baby's bottle, which is against kind of recommendations, but that she looked at the packaging and it said to wait till four months, so she decided not to. So sometimes they were helpful, and it kind of goes to show that the importance of packaging and how that can be an influence to parents. Um, parents are very worried about choking and very worried about allergies in the Republic. That came out quite a lot. Um, so they felt that often a little bit more knowledge around first aid would be good, so that could be something we can look at as a recommendation. Um, so just to focus in on grandparents, so as I said, some people considered the grandmum as the expert. Um, you know, she'll talk about how she listened to the nurse, but you know, the last bit, I was already going to do it anyway after talking to mum. Um, and then another parent said, you know, I really, I kind of just do my own thing. I'll try and when I want to do it, not sooner, just because you think he should have it. Sometimes grandparents try to give you advice but you really don't want it, even though their heart's in the right place. So a lot of parents discuss that kind of well-meaning advice and how parents and other parents and family members kind of came to speak to them and gave an unwanted opinion and this kind of, everybody has an opinion on how you should feed your baby, but they don't necessarily want to hear that opinion. Um, and then some parents discussed having to like defend themselves or justify a decision, oh excuse the typo there, um, and that that made them feel, again, another lack of confidence, feeling, why am I being questioned on my decisions that I haven't asked for a question on, I suppose. Um, and then for health professionals, I think it was a first-time mother that said, you know, you're really sticking to what you're told. Um, but then other parents talked about, they 
really enjoyed getting the health professional advice, but it wasn't always the right time. Um, you're, you're given loads of information when you leave the hospital, your head's not in the right place. Um, and then you have a three month checkup, and I think again the next one is nine months if I'm correct. So some parents felt that the kind of time for weaning advice has been missed there. Um, and then some people simply don't trust their health professional or their public health nurse. Um, they talked about knowing better themselves and every, every baby's different. And then another thing that I've seen come out quite a lot is how the health visitor in particular speaks to the parent seems to be a very important factor in how much they decide to trust the information. So one parent spoke about how she was talked at instead of talked to. Um, and she instantly dismissed the information she was given because she just felt patronised by the health visitor. Um, and other parents discussed how their health visitor was really nice. Um, and that seemed to equate to really knowledgeable and informed because they were nice. So um, it seems to make a big influence. And then some of the other concerns, oh, I just mentioned, yeah, timing of advice. Um, and then the practicalities of starting solids. So whilst lots of parents felt they got loads of tips and advice about recipes and pureeing and putting things in little pots, but at the end of it, they didn't know, you know, what time of day should I start? Or like, do I give them a bottle first? And then how long do I wait? It's simple, practical advice they wanted. And I think what came out from that was that they felt commercial baby books had more information about that type of thing than the, the guidance they were given by the HSE or their public health nurse. Um, so I'll just give you over to Eleni to talk about recruitment in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about the same aspects that Louise touched on, but for Northern Ireland this time. So, um, just like, or similarly to Republic, we recruited through um, social media community organizations, mainly community organizations, such as uh, Sure Start groups, parent and toddler groups in areas of high deprivation, and community initiative groups um, such as um, centres working with women. So we recruited women from Belfast and towns outside Belfast and um, we um, sampling was collected through a snowball and purpose purposive uh, technique until information saturation was reached. And these are the areas that uh, we overall have recruited from um, on the entire um, island of Ireland. Um, so, uh, data collection, uh, Virginia and I contacted eight focus groups overall uh, with 37 participants between March and July 2017. Um, the participants range from three to six for each one of the focus groups. Um, the focus groups were recorded and the initial coding has already commenced. Um, data was also entered for demographics, infant health, uh, feeding, parental, social support and quality of life. Um, and as I said, the focus groups, the uh, discussions were audio recorded, transcribed, and uh, we will start um, analyzing them using thematic analysis soon. Um, some challenges um, uh, during the recruitment and the data collection that we had to deal with. So engagement with gatekeepers is not always easy. Um, also, some public holidays um, affected the group attendance from which um, we recruited. In our case, it was mainly um, Easter and the summer holidays. Um, ensuring the correct demographic, uh, we've reached out to them, just like Louisa said. Um, we dealt with some bureaucratic uh, and administrative issues in room hiring as well. Some centers were not that flexible as others. Um, Moms obviously not showing up for the focus group, just like Louis said, kids are getting sick. Uh, moms are not always able to attend the focus group, even though they seemed interested initially. Um, and the noise and the limited attention that came from mainly infants being there and just being um, a distraction. Uh, now, uh, I think, Virginia, you're. Um, so, yeah, so these are just some of the characteristics. Um, from the participants from our groups, so some are quite similar to Louise, others aren't um, as diverse. So um, all 37 participants are biological mother, which probably reflects uh, the primary caregiver um, in these situations and being off work. Um, there was quite an age range as well, sort of 19 to 39, but on average the, the mothers were about 30. Um, the babies at the time of the groups were about seven months. Um, again, we had one 16 month old who would have fallen within the criteria when we recruited them, but again, um, it sometimes took quite a while to get a group up and running. So 
Um, not many were breastfed, there was about 21, but there was a great duration in how long this was for. So um, three days being the shortest duration, um, six months the longest, but most of them seemed to be around three or four months that they exclusively breastfed for. Um, and all but seven of them had started weaning their baby. And again, there was a great range in when they had actually commenced this, so between two and six months. Um, mostly towards six months, five months. Obviously, there are some cases where it was a lot earlier. Um, and the, the babies were mostly, so 35 of the 37 were uh, rated very healthy or healthy, so um, didn't give them to have any health issues. So in terms of the um, demographics, uh, we found actually perhaps compared to the Republic, it wasn't quite as diverse. So the vast majority were born in Northern Ireland um, and were white. Um, quite a high proportion were educated at degree level or above, so a degree or a postgrad degree. Um, and again, 26 were employed or self-employed, so the rest would have um, categorised themselves as homemakers or unemployed and searching for a job. Uh, again, quite a high percentage were married or cohabiting, otherwise they would have been single or divorced. Um, and 16 qualified for Healthy Start, so that's a scheme, um, it's quite strict criteria, but uh, for low-income parents, they get vouchers for um, sort of vitamins and fruit and vegetables. Um, and then another measure for um, the suitability was social support, so quite a high proportion felt they got enough help. And we did have some further sort of questions looking into support from grandparents, and that's where some might have been suitable to take part. <coughs> So also within the questionnaires, we did collect some information on baby's first food, so it's just a free response category. So um, you can see some of the quite common ones, so like baby rice or baby porridge, um, a lot of fruit purees and vegetables and things. But then you've also got things like sausage and chips, which is a bit concerning, um, and then sort of meals such as spaghetti bolognese, so it might have been for the older ones, but um, quite a variation there. So if we come on to the uh, emerging influences, so just to stress, this is very initial coding, as um, we've only recently collected the data up in Northern Ireland, um, and we expect this will develop a bit more. But you can see there's some very similar influences to the Republic and some different ones. Um, so something that came out on top was health visitors. So this featured heavily in all of the focus groups, um, both positive and negative. Again, issues with trust, um, whether they were given the correct information. Others went straight to them as the expert, and it'll be interesting to see if that's more first-time mums or mothers with sort of second, third children. Um, peers and friends also had quite an influence, so social circle, um, other mothers. Um, books and sort of official guidance, so whereas they didn't refer to sort of explicit leaflets or guidance, a lot were saying, oh, six months, and that came up quite a lot, so it suggests perhaps they've actually had that from somewhere. And Annabelle Carmel books, which I believe have a lot on weaning, so that was quite a common. Um, marketing of products came up quite often, so again, sort of the age range put on products and what they're appropriate for, um, with some saying, oh, if they said it was free from birth, then I know it'd be safe to start weaning earlier. So again, there's a disconnect between um, sort of the knowledge of when it's appropriate to start weaning. So cues from the baby was also quite um, a big influence, so parents were able to cite, oh, they could hold their head up and they were grabbing my food and they were able to sit up and um, so they decided the baby was ready perhaps before the official sort of six-month period. Um, again, grandparents came up an awful lot in the discussions, um, probably more so they felt that grandparents were a bit out of date and didn't realise sort of how to... Um, wean a baby in sort of with current guidance and they weren't aware of what was safe, so and there was some discussion around balancing how to you know, use that information against what they felt was appropriate. Um, and that came into sort of mother's intuition. So I know my baby best um, and previous experience to so a lot of them would have had previous children and they use that to sort of inform what they were doing this time around. Um, and then again, so social media online, Facebook was cited quite a lot as sort of forums and groups to talk about. And then um, I think someone used the phrase Dr. Google, so they just Googled everything and felt that was quite a good source of information. So. Um, we've just pulled out a couple of these to give you some quotes um, as an example. So as I said, sort of the expert, and this usually um, referred to the health visitor, so some mothers felt that that was the person to go to, she trusted them, she'd go straight to them if she had any queries. Um, and again, there was an opinion that they'd be more likely to be up to date than parents or even their own grandparents because um, of the evidence base and um, what to use. But then there were also comments of varied experiences. It depends on your health visitor themselves. So some were talking about how they had older health visitors who were perhaps not up to date with training, and they were actually saying more personal opinion rather than um, evidence-based information. So um, this was both sort of perceived to be a positive and a negative influence depending on who you spoke to. 
Um, and then I said sort of influence from cues from the baby, so that influenced um, the mother's practices. So um, <clears throat> a lot of the mothers talked about preferences that were already coming out. So um, this mother was talking about finger food and perhaps baby-led weaning and pureed foods. The baby didn't seem so keen, so that would um, sort of lead what they might offer the baby in future. Um, and as I said, sort of developmental cues of signs of readiness. So she mentioned she had the neck control and the tongue thrust, so she was paying attention um, to the baby being ready. And also, um, sort of baby's health, so um, finding the baby was constipated after sort of introducing weaning and then adapted what they were offering as a result of that. Um, so I think I'm just going to pass back to Louise now about what worked for the project. Yeah, just to kind of sum up about, like, if we were to do the project again, um, the, in hindsight, like, um, contacting probably double or triple the amount of people, like, organisations you want a response from would, would be the way to go. Um, I mean, I contacted probably 50 organisations and, you know, about 10 got back to me. Um, welcoming the infants definitely made life much easier for parents. Uh, they, it, was, it just seemed to be a big relief um, having venues that they were familiar with and not having to Google Maps or, you know, figure out where they were going, if they were close by to the areas you were targeting and stuff. Um, and just, you know, reminding them that it's just going to be an informal chat, tea and coffee, you know, kind of making them at ease with the fact that they were being tape recorded as well. Um, I also, I mean, I think it's a given, but reminded them that nobody would ever hear it, you know, because I think some people were quite aware of it at the start. Um, again, child-friendly environment, um, having a second facilitator to take notes and help with kind of welcoming parents in, dealing with babies, uh, having some toys as well was kind of something I learned very quickly because they babies get bored um, but not hard toys because they bang those on the table and that's not easy to transcribe um, and then just arranging it like I found where the gatekeeper was helpful they would give me the parents number um, and I could then ask them what time suited but not all gatekeepers are happy to give you a parents number which is absolutely fair enough um, but you know it's kind of the more you can work around their schedule the more people tended to come and um, so Having a gatekeeper that as well understands the project, and I know like you can get, give as much information as you want, but they don't always necessarily have time or you know are able to take it in or sit down and read what you're trying to do. But I find where they kind of understood what I was looking for it made it much easier. Sometimes I turned up to groups and they didn't realise that it wasn't just a questionnaire, even though you feel like you've explained that. But um, I guess it's just a communication thing and reminding people what what you need. Um, and then the thank, thank you vouchers were a really nice thing to be able to give. Um, parents really appreciated them and I think they just saw it as, you know, you appreciate in their time. Um, so we gave 20 euro one for all vouchers. Um, so then to summarise our findings so far, again, like must reiterate that these are like preliminary findings, but you know, it seems that parents feel like they're getting information from all ends, you know, um, everybody has an opinion on what you should be doing. So they're kind of receiving well-meaning kind of tips from family as well as professional advice as well as baby books that aren't quite in line with maybe with the the formal baby books and um they're they're just navigating their own way um you know they're going with their instincts at the end of it because this kind of you get a feeling you have an instinct and every baby's different and you know your baby best and that seems to kind of come through i think in, in all focus groups um and then the barriers and limitations were the not only be within groups but between groups we had such a diverse kind of set of parents um, and I found that even if I had a, a, like a focus group where you might have younger more low income parents and also kind of older more educated parents in the same group it was naturally it was like the more educated parents were more confident and dominant and often the, the parents you really wanted to hear from weren't as confident to speak and I think that's a limitation in itself but it would have been very difficult to try and only get certain types of people together um, and as well as that what we found is that our inclusion criteria does not guarantee the target population I, I think that's a given as well but um, because we had such a broad criteria for disadvantage um, we had all sorts of people who do all sorts of things and have different backgrounds and cultures um, and as well as that a barrier of going through communi community organisations that already engage with disadvantaged people is that you're still only getting the parents that are willing to go to things and like engage with community organisations. So um, there's definitely a group or a kind of demographic of parents out there that we can't claim to represent or to, to have findings on because they're hard to reach and we didn't succeed in that. Um, some parents aren't in a position to you know, attend a focus group uh, at a certain time and be there and be organised or for whatever reason. Um, and I think one parent in one of the groups kind of summed it up quite nicely. She said, 
we're here tonight obviously because we went to something else but there's all the mothers that possibly aren't getting out there going to things because they're so bloody overwhelmed or isolated just can't get themselves together and they're nearly I don't know what the word is struggling and they're left to struggle and um, so I think a nice conclusion of this as well is that maybe there, we need to find another way to get the, the super hard to reach parents um, and one suggestion might be kind of facilitating one-to-one -one interviews because attendance at focus groups maybe just isn't possible um, so to conclude, um, it is chal challenging but feasible to get disadvantaged parents to attend focus groups. Um, but one big thing that we learned is that you need to allocate enough time for doing the groundwork for recruitment. And um, whilst we had a huge amount of time, we still didn't quite meet, you know, our intended target, because um, it does take time to build up trust and relationships and organise the lo logistics. I suppose um, community groups are ideal, but potentially again not targeting the most at-risk parents. Um, and just being accommodating and maybe again having to consider a phone call or a, a home visit or something might might get those people that you really want to hear from um, and then emerging influences on practices on the island of Ireland on the island of Ireland mm -hmm. appear to be consistent with previous literature but again analysis is not complete so we, we might still have more findings so watch this space um, and just to thank everybody else involved in the project <laughs> that's us